Ma'am, can we start? Yeah, please. Uh, Anit, please start. Anit, uh, you have to unmute yourself. Uh, a very good evening to everyone uh, uh, logged in and joined us today. So uh, we welcome to the first ISO General Club meeting. Um, and uh, we have two wonderful uh, two papers for discussion. And to start off this event, I'd like to start with the auspicious prayer song. to in, uh, invite our conveners for the uh, uh, program today, Dr. Chamila Ayo, ma'am. Uh, madam is the Vice President-Elect of Foxy 2024 and uh, ICOG Governing Council Member of 2021 and 2023. Uh, next, I'd like to invite Dr. Ashwini Balaro, ma'am. Madam. madam is the consultant of PD Hinduja Hospital and uh, past Vice President of Foxy 2013 and Governing Council Member of ICOG. Um, I'll, I'll invite madam to invite all the guests. Thank you so much, Anit. Uh, it's an honor to welcome all of you for this first ICOG Journal Club program. And uh, it's an honor to have the chairperson of ICOG, Dr. Lakshmi Srikande, Madam, with us. I'd like to welcome her as well as the president of Foxy, Dr. Rishikesh Paisar, who has uh, uh, sent us greetings as well as well wishes for the program. And uh, I would like to welcome Lakshmi Srikande, Madam, to say a few words. She is the chairperson ICOG for this year and 23. She's a national corresponding editor of the Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology of India, Jogi, National Corresponding Secretary Association of Medical Women of India. She's a founder, patron, and president ISOPA Vidarbha chapter. She's been a chairperson of the IMS Education Committee. She's several, received several awards, and she's a great academician, and it's an always an honor to listen to her. And I request Madam to uh, greet us on the start, uh, starting of this auspicious day of the first day of the uh, Journal Club program. Yeah. Thank you, Charmila. You will have to stop screen sharing. Uh, today, we are starting with the Journal Club series of this tenure. And I'm so happy, Charmila, that as a convener, you have rolled out a very, very good program. And uh, it is said that well begun is half done. So I'm so happy to welcome you all. First and foremost is, of course, our President Foxy. Dr. Rishikesh Pai, then Dr. Secretary General, Dr. Madhuri Patel, our conveners, Dr. Charmila, Dr. Ashwini, we have coordinator, Dr. Manisha Bey, and our international expert, has she joined? Dr. Asha Risingani. She's joined, madam. She's there, Dr. Asha. Yeah. Asha, you are most welcome to our uh, Foxy ICOG Journal Club. And we have our presenters. I welcome both the presenters, Dr. Pushpalata, Dr. Alina. And we have experts, Dr. Ashish Kumar, Dr. Poonam, Dr. Mala, and Dr. Tamkin Rappani. So why we have started the journal club? You all must be uh, asking. I know you all are great academicians and uh, teachers. So you don't want to know. But for my dear audience, why? What is the point of having a journal club? So this information you should spread out to your colleagues that it is essential to join journal club, to keep yourself updated with the scientific literature. You have to learn how to critically review scientific papers, identify areas of collaboration with fellow journal clubbers, share knowledge and ideas with scientists, both in and out of your field of research and learn how to present your ideas and participate in scientific debate. And as ICOG is an academic wing of Foxy, we are there for academics. And that is why 
we have started with this journal club activity. And as a convener, I'm sure Dr. Chavila has taken all these points into consideration when she is choosing the paper. And, but for the presenter, when you are presenting, please present it in a story format because it is critical for you also to understand what you are presenting and the audience, you have to create the interest in the audience in the paper which you are presenting. And also, Chamila would like to tell the audience that why you came across, how you came across this article, what in why you have chosen this article, what information the audience will have to understand from this study, why it is important, and you have to avoid the jargon and be guided by the information in the introduction. And as an audience, I know it is very easy to jump to the conclusions and to criticize, but before criticism, give the authors their due credit for their elegant experiments, consider the limitations we all work under, and part of critical analysis is understanding and appreciating the good experimental design. Of course, you all have to be very, very active listener. I know when the paper goes through peer review, almost the bad part of it is weeded out. But still, the lot is to be done and that is why we are having this journal club to discuss these papers. So what as an audience you have to look for? You can look for the sensationalist headlines, misinterpreted results, conflicts of interest, speculative language about the sample size, inappropriate statistical analysis, unrepresentative samples, no blind testing is done, whether the results are just cherry picked results. So there is n number of things which you can pick out from these paper presentations and audience. You have to actively participate in the journal club uh, discussions and be prepared and uh, be prepared to exchange your ideas in this journal club. Apart from this journal club, ICOG is conducting various other academic activities for the, its fellows and members. As you all can see, we are having Foxy ICOG, Gurukul Medha training programs, research methodology web series, Sankalp webinar on family planning. We are having ICOG masterclass, ICOG tutorials, Guru Mantra web series, and we are having ICOG weekend online certificate courses. Apart from these three-day courses, we also run six-month courses on reproductive medicine, endoscopy, fetal medicine, USG, vaginal surgery, critical care in obstetrics. So just log on to our website, icogonline.org, and you will be able to see the web series calendar for the month of December and January, which we have posted on our website. And this is the Foxy ICOG National Conference, which will be held at Nagpur on 4th and 5th of March, 2023. And I welcome you all to the Orange City for this conference. So thank you. Thank you so much for logging in and thank you conveners for coming out with the first ICOG Journal Club. And I hand over back to the Chamila for further proceedings. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, quite an extensive program for all of us throughout the year. Thank you so much for that. I'd like to welcome uh, Dr. Parag Beniwale, the Vice Chairperson of Foxy. Anit, can I have a CV? Uh, he's a senior consultant from Pune, is the vice chairperson of ICOG at present, and he's been the he's the president of the Menopause Society from Pune. Next, please. Uh, Madhuri Patel, madam, is the secretary general of Foxy. She has been the joint secretary of Foxy before. She's been the committee member of FIGO preterm birth, and she's been the associate director for the Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology of India. She has del delivered various lectures at national as well as international levels. Next, please. Dr. Ashok Kumar, sir, is the Secretary of the Indian College of Obstetrics and Gynecology. He's a Director, Professor and Head at the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology, Atal Bihari Vajpayee Institute of Medical Sciences and Dr. Ram Monohar Lohia Hospital, New Delhi. He's uh, uh, delivered several uh, lectures at the national and international levels. Next, please. Dr. Swarna, madam, is the Deputy Secretary General of Foxy. Uh, she is a teacher in endocrinology at the University of South Wales, United Kingdom. She's been the treasurer of Foxy, joint treasurer, and she's been the general se joint secretary of MOGS, and she's been the secretary of MOGS also. And Next, please. Editor emeritus of our journal. Editor emeritus of Jogi Journal. Next. 
Uh, Dr. Geeta Balsarkar is presently the editor in chief of the Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology of India. She's a treasurer of MOGS, past president Association of Medical Women in India. And uh, she's an uh, active uh, participant of most of our programs. Next, please. I would like to welcome the no, international no, 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 no. expert, Dr. Asham Asha, uh, Dr. Manisha Beck, the coordinator, all the national experts, Dr. Ashish Sir, Dr. Poonam, Dr. Mala, Dr. Tamkin, and the presenters, Dr. Pushpalata Kumari and Dr. Alina to the program. And a special thanks to all the delegates who have logged in. May I have the uh, CV of Anit, please, Anit. Anit is a coordinator for this program. He has uh, done his MSOG from Madras Medical College and he's an MRCOG. He's done his fellowship in reproductive medicine from Simar Cochin. And he has done a certification course from Germany, USA, and from Cochin. And he is presently a consultant at Sri Kumaran Speciality Hospital and Fertility Center. Anit, I request you to take over the program, please. Um, uh, uh, thank you, ma'am, for this wonderful introduction. Uh, so uh, moving on to the program. Uh, um, uh, for first, I'd like to uh, introduce our international expert, Dr. Asha Madam. Uh, Madam is the professor of maternal fetal medicine of University of Washington, Seattle, USA. Madam is also the SMFM Global Ambassador for India. Uh, she is currently the professor of University of Washington and tenured professor of University of Iowa. Also the professor of Albany Medical College, Albany Medical Center, New York, and assistant professor of Hopkins University. Madam, I'm honored to introduce you. Um, uh, so, uh, and next, next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Um, Manisha uh, Beck, Madam. Madam is the professor and unit head of uh, CMC Wellur. Uh, Madam is also the president Wellur Obstetrics and Gynecology Society and a member National Committee of Genetics and Fetal Medicine uh, for 2021 and 2022. I'd like to invite Dr. Uh, Manisha Beck, Madam, to give a short introductory talk on uh, on, uh, on clinical research methodology on uh, uh, how to how to critically apply the paper. Madam? Yeah. So is my screen visible? Yes. Yes, Manisha. Yeah. Okay. So just a minute. You have to click on that and then it moves. Yeah, it's moving. So a warm welcome to all of them. Thank you, Dr. Lakshmi, Dr. Charmila, and Dr. Parag, and so many other esteemed guests, and Dr. Asha for taking out time to be with us. And thank you for inviting us, Dr. Charmila and team, to be able to share this presentation. So basically, I will be talking about a critical appraisal of a journal. Uh, as Dr. Lakshmi said, uh, out of jargon and to make it in the form of story. We'll try to simplify as much as possible. So basically, we'll be sharing in terms of research, question, design, methodology, sample size, statistical analysis, results and conclusions as briefly that I can. Okay, so when we talk about uh, when we talk about a research question, the research question that a study is set out to answer should be simple and not complicated. And it should actually tell us about the, uh, it should, uh, uh, it should uh, address a knowledge gap, meaning that it should not look into something that has already been done. I mean, the validity of a study increases if it explores areas which have not been previously studied. Now, in a study design, is the study design chosen whether it is appropriate to answer the research question? That is something that needs to be looked at. For example, if you want to compare two drugs, say drug A and drug B for control of hypertension, then the best study design would be to do a randomized control trial. Similarly, for different different questions that you have in mind, there are different study designs that we can think of. So if you look at the various kinds of study designs, you, there are experimental study and there are observational study. Observational would be more of a descriptive type, like a retrospective, a case control, a cross-sectional study, whereas experimental are the ones which are uh, either controlled trials or uncontrolled trials. When we say controlled trials, meaning you have an intervention arm and you have a control arm. Whereas when we say uncontrolled trials, they do not have a control. Now on the right and left hand side, you can see there's a hierarchy of scientific evidence. What does this hierarchy tell you? This tells you that of all the study designs that we have, the best 
scientific evidence, the strongest scientific evidence is available from meta-analysis and systematic reviews. And this is closely followed by randomized control trials. And the weakest one is at the bottom of the pyramid, which is provided by case reports, opinion papers, and letters. So what does this tell us? That randomized control trials and meta-analysis is probably the highest form of uh, uh, studies that we can do. So what are the characteristics of a research design that we should think is appropriate? So when we talk about any research design and we look into the journal, what, what are the things that it should bring out? It should be neutral. There should be no bias. It should be reliable. It should be valid and it should be gen it can be it should be able to uh, the results should be able to be generalized. So when we say uh, what is the reliability, that means it there should be integrity into the research. When we say validity, there are two types of validity. One is internal, one is external, about which I will be explaining. That means if you were to repeat the same RCT or the same study again and again, you should be able to get results. When we say generalization, meaning Whatever is true for your sample population, can it be extrapolated to the true population which is out there to our patients? So that is what is the meaning of generalization. So these are the inherent characteristics that a research design, a good research design should be having. Now, uh, what are some of the ways in which these can be attained? For example, there is something called randomization, which will make sure that the baseline characteristics of the comparator arm, the intervention arm, and the control arm should be similar. Before we start out the study, the two arms should have the same, arm, same study population without much difference. Then that rules out selection bias. Then there is something that we should be sticking to the protocol that we decided in the beginning. So, Compliance check is again important. And now with the CTRI registration from 2017 onwards, all randomized control trials have to be registered with the CTRI. So your protocol for the trial is actually on public domain. And if you deviate from that, then it is a, it's a black mark. So that is a kind of a safety check. And then also we have to see that the results are not due to chance. For that, we have to uh, take adequate sample size. So as Madam Dr. Lakshmi was saying, the sample size is too small. I'll be talking about all that uh, as uh, uh, briefly as possible. So when we look at any randomized, there is a PCOT st uh, statement that is there for each randomized control trial. So it has to be, it has to be uh, described under these headings. P stands for describing the patient population then I stands for what is your intervention. For example, the, the trial that Dr. Arina will be presenting later, it actually looks at progesterone versus placebo in twin, in twin gestation. So our patients will be all ladies with twin gestation. Intervention would be your vaginal progesterone. Your control arm would be your placebo. Then we have outcomes. Outcomes, you can have one primary outcome and multiple secondary outcomes. So the primary outcome in that study was spontaneous uh, preterm birth between 24 to 34 weeks. So that was the outcome. Then what is the time frame in which the study was done? And apart from that, there is something called S. S basically tells you what is the study design, which is answering the question, the research question. Okay. Before we go on, just a few basic things about statistics we need to know. There is something known as null hypothesis. Null hypothesis basically assumes that when you are doing a study, trying to compare the two, like uh, as I gave the example before, drug A and drug B for hypertension, null hypothesis says there is no difference between the two drugs. So that means drug A is equally efficacious or has the same efficacy as drug B. So that is what null hypothesis says. Now, if you do a study, and you find out that there is a difference, you would like to reject the null hypothesis. But before you reject the null hypothesis and say, no, I think drug B is superior or drug A is superior, you need to look at what is known as the probability or the p-value. So there, the, the important concepts here to understand is what is type 1 or alpha error and what is type 2 or beta error. So when we assume that the two drugs are same or the two treatment groups are same, but when you conducted the RCT, you found, oh, there is a difference between the two drugs. Now, whether this difference is actually by chance, by luck or by flu, or is there actually a difference is determined by what is known as the p-value or the probability. So if you get a p-value of less than 0.05, what does it mean? It means that the possibility or the probability that the result of difference that I have got is because of chance is less than 5%. In other words, 95% it is not because of chance. And because 95% it is not due to chance, 
I will take that as statistically significant. And therefore, I will reject my null hypothesis because there is a statistically significant difference. Now, there is something known as a beta error. Beta error is more important for us. It is more common. Now, what happens in a beta error is that there is difference between two drugs. Let's say drug A and drug B again for control of hypertension. But because your sample size was small or because of other factors, you showed that both of them are similar. So you were not able to detect the difference which actually exists and that is known as a beta error. And to overcome that, you need to have an adequately powered study. When we say power of the study means the sample size, the power of the study, meaning the sample size should be such that it should be able to demonstrate the difference that actually exists. To simplify type 1 error and type 2 error, you can see on the, on the left hand side, you can see the type 1 error, you have a false positive that uh, there is no difference, but you find out the difference. And type two error, there is a difference, and you say there is no difference because your sample size was not adequate or your power was not uh, adequate or uh, to be able to see the difference that actually exists. Now, when, the, when uh, we do sample size calculation, there are certain things that we have to keep in mind. For example, uh, this, how do we calculate the sample size? Usually, uh, similar studies are taken, similar, uh, similar study designs are taken, or if there is no similar study, what we do is generally do a pilot study before you do an original research, and based on that, a sample size is calculated. It should be adequately powered. I just explained what is the need, because if it, the sample size is too small, you will not be able to demonstrate the difference that already or the, in that uh, actually exists. So again, this is a slide to show type 1 and type 2 error. Null hypothesis says that both are equal. But if you see the red area, that is the type 1 error that we have picked up that there is a difference. Whereas alternative hypothesis says that there is a difference, but because your sample size was small, you did not pick up the difference. So that becomes a type 2 error. So to eliminate the type 2 error, which is more common, you need to have a sample size which is adequate so that you can show the difference. Okay, now there is something called randomization, which is important for us to understand. What exactly is randomization? Randomization is the process by which assignment of treatment for each patient is decided by chance. So it, it eliminates selection bias. So we want to remove biases as much as possible. A bias is a systematic error that is introduced into the study, which can affect your results. So this bias I will be talking about later. But I will just want to talk about randomization here. So there is a simple concept. There are different ways of randomization. Block randomization is something that is commonly done. And this is how block randomization is done. So if you have an entire, let's say there are 24 women you want to study. It can be more. So the entire study population is divided into different individual sizes. So here it is divided into six blocks of four individuals each. Now within each block, you can choose your patients randomly. But the, because the block design is equal, you will have equal number of people in uh, uh, receiving one treatment and uh, an equal number of people receiving the other treatment. So no matter in which order you choose, the number of people in treat one arm and the number of treatment in the control arm will always be equal. Now, why is that important? This is important. For example, if you were to do a study and then you decided somewhere you had to stop the study. So you had to do an interim analysis of the study. So if you do an interim analysis of the study, if you do a block randomization, let's say you stopped after block three. But if you were to stop here also, you will see that your number of people in the first arm and the number of people in the second arm will still be equal. So you will be able to do the analysis. So that is the advantage of doing the block randomization. Now, what do we talk about bias? Bias is basically a systematic error into the sampling which skews the results of the research and towards a specific outcome. There are different types of bias that is there. There can be selection bias, information bias, confounders and all, and there are different ways to eliminate the bias. First we said is randomization. So the selection of the patient is not in your hand and you are doing it scientifically. Second is something known as blinding or masking. I will be talking about it later. And third, uh, again, because of randomization, what, what is ensured is that baseline characteristics of participants in both the groups are comparable. That means that you have not, uh, you have not been biased in selecting your patients. So there are two, uh, there are different uh, types of blinding. The most common is the, the 
double blinded and the single blinded. Now on top you top panel, you see the single blinding. Here what happens, the researcher who is doing the study knows which patient is receiving what treatment, like treatment A and treatment B. But the patient or the study participant is not aware what treatment they are receiving. Now, if you look at the lower panel, the double blinding, here the researcher also does not know which patient is receiving what treatment and the patients are not aware. There is something known as the triple blinding where the researcher doesn't know, the participants don't know, and even the one who's analyzing the data does not know. That's called triple blinding. And there is something called as open label. What happens in open label? Because of the nature of the treatment that you are giving, sometimes a blinding is not possible. For example, if you were to compare, let's say, uh, echo sprint with heparin for APLA or something like that. So now because injection and echo sprint is a tablet, you can actually, the blinding might not be possible. So that is, that is called an open label uh, trial. Okay, now we talk about a few ways of statistical analysis. There are two ways in which analysis can be done. One is called intention to treat analysis. So if you read the title on top, once randomized, always analyzed. What does this mean? This means that if a person uh, if a person has been randomized to receive a particular treatment, they will always be analyzed under that group, whether they actually received the treatment or not, whether they discontinued the treatment or they died or they stopped treatment early or they changed over to the other arm, they will still be analyzed under that particular group where they were randomized. So that is known as intention to treat analysis. There is another thing which is known as the per protocol analysis. What happens in the per protocol analysis is that a person will be assessed under the particular group, the treatment according to the treatment they have received. So if they have received treatment under group B, they will be analyzed under group B. If they have not received treatment under group B, they will not be analyzed under group B. So the better of the two is actually intention to treat analysis. Why? Because it mirrors our real life scenario. That's very common in clinical practice. You give them some treatment, they will discontinue or they will decline or they will stop early, but you still analyze them. So that is why intention to treat analysis is a better form of uh, statistical analysis. Now, how do we interpret the results when we get the results? So supposing we were to compare two methods like the RCT we will be discussing, we will be discussing vaginal progesterone versus placebo. So how do we find out the treatment effect? So we find out the difference. Our primary outcome is spontaneous preterm birth between 24 to 34 weeks. So we can find out the difference in terms of absolute difference. So, so much difference, let's say 10% the spontaneous preterm birth in the progesterone arm and 8% in the placebo arm. Let's say that is so we can see the difference in terms of percentage or we can calculate what is known as the relative risk or the odds ratio. Odds ratio uh, is a number actually it tells you that this much uh, the chance or the odds of having a spontaneous preterm birth is so much more in the progesterone arm or in the placebo arm in comparison to the other arm. So that is how you there are different ways in which you can uh, not, notify the difference in between the two arms. Now, the concept of 95% confidence interval is something that is important for us to Basically, what is 95% confidence interval? Whenever we are presenting any treatment effect, it has to be given in a range, which is called as 95% confidence interval. What does this range denote? This range is a range of values around your measurement, around your treatment effect. Your treatment effect, it is in mean or in odds ratio or in relative risk. Basically, what it means is, if you were to repeat the same RCT 100 times, 95% of the times your result will should lie between that same range. That is what it means. That is what, or you are 95% confidence that this, the true population uh, effect is lying within that range. That is what it means. So that is why knowing 95% confidence interval is, is important. The larger the sample size, the narrower the 95% confidence interval and the more accurate your result is. That means it can be generalized into true population. But if you have a very large range of 95% confidence interval, then it cannot be extrapolated into your true population. So uh, how do we know whether the looking at the 95% confidence interval, can we say that the, the result that we got is statistically significant? So again, it depends upon what is the 95% confidence interval representing. If it is representing an absolute or a mean difference between the groups, then it should not cross zero. If it is crossing zero, that means it is not statistic. 
But if it is representing relative risk or odds ratio, then 95% confidence interval should not cross one. Otherwise, it is the effect is not statistically significant. Now, another important thing that the study we must look at, uh, look at is how the, uh, the researchers or the authors have dealt with the dropout rate. What was the dropout rate? So, uh, so that is called the attrition rate. And uh, how do we take? How have they taken care of the attrition rate? Was the dropout rate more in one group and less in another group? And uh, was the dropout rate more than what is usually expected? And uh, if the dropout rate was there, what was done to take care of it? Usually, what most of the researchers will do is to account for a dropout rate of around five to ten percent. They will recruit extra. So. Uh, after you get a sample size, you calculate 10% extra to inflate your sample size so that if you have a dropout rate, you still get your sample size and that uh, your, the power of the study does not change. So that is one way of doing the dropout, uh, taking care of the dropout rate. Or you can do what is intention to treat analysis. Even if the patient has dropped out of, say, let's say treatment A, but you still analyze them on the treatment A. That is another method of looking at, at or taking care of your dropout rate or you can analyze them as the worst case scenario. For example, if you were studying mortality as one of the outcome, if they have dropped out, you are not sure they have actually had mortality, but you just label them as mortality and analyze them. Now coming to what is known as the internal or the external validity. Now each RCT, there are two things to be considered in any RCT. What is the internal validity of the RCT and what is the external validity of the RCT? The internal validity of the RCT means that it should be true to itself and external validity means it should be true to the population. Okay, so what are the, what is internal validity? It tells that there is integrity in the study, how well it was conducted, whether bias was taken control of, how were the confounders or the confusing factors taken care of and how well this was conducted, that is the internal validity. So if you, if you have internal validity, no matter how many times you repeat the RCT, you will get the same result. That is called the internal validity. There is something called the external validity. External validity means that you study the sample population. For example, in the event trial that we are going to talk about, twins population we studied, who received vaginal progesterone versus placebo, and we got a particular result. Now, if you were to do the same study in the real life population, would you get the same result? If the study has external validity, you should be able to get the same result. So external validity basically relatable, your findings are in the real world. Whether you can generalize it to the real population that you are dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis, that is denoted by your external validity. Now for RCT, this is a very uh, this is a very good tool to assess. This is called critical appraisal skills program. So it's like a checklist. So checklist, uh, it, it has got three, it has for different things, is the basic study design valid, valid for a randomized control trial? What was the uh, inclusion exclusion criteria, the methodology, how, will the, how were the results represented? Will the results help locally? So, so different sections are there. And under each section, you have different questions. And these questions you have to, uh, they have three responses, whether it is yes or no, or whether you can't tell. So based on that, you can score actually a randomized control trial. So, uh, so this kind of, uh, this, this tool is actually very helpful to, uh, to critically appraise a randomized control trial. And I would actually encourage everybody to uh, kind of look into it and that will help us design randomized control trials also when we are looking at it. Thank you for a very patient listening. Um, thank you, uh, Dr. Manisha, ma'am, for such a clear and crisp summary of research methodology and how to appraise a, uh, uh, how to critically appraise a research paper. Um, so, um, moving on, just a minute, sorry. Uh, so moving on, uh, so we'll move on to our uh, journal club uh, uh, paper. So our first paper that we have today is a retrospective study analyzing indications and outcomes of mid-trimester emergency circulage published in Tropical Doctor 2022. Uh, we have one of the authors here with us, Dr. Manisha Bam, uh, for our today's paper, journal club paper discussion. So for this paper discussion, I would like to uh, invite our uh, experts uh, the first expert is Dr. Ashish Kumar 
Mukhopadhyay, sir is the principal and unit chief of GNDO CSS College of Obstetrics and Gynae Child at Kolkata. Sir has been a vice president for OXI and a governing council member of ICOG. I welcome you, sir, for the webinar today. Um, our, our next expert for the day is Dr. Poonam Verma Shokumar. Madam is the professor head of OB-GYN MGIMS Sevagram Varda. Um, Madam, um, uh, is, Madam has published around 78 papers and eight chapters in international and national journal. Um, uh, Madam is uh, I know research person for uh, TAG um, uh, for um, for various government uh, programs and uh, uh, initiatives. And the madam has held roles and responsibilities uh, in various international organizations. I welcome uh, madam for uh, being an expert in today's discussion. Uh, our presenter for the paper is Dr. Pushpalata Kumari. Dr. Pushpalata Kumari, madam, is the Associate Professor, Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology in uh, 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 Christian Medical College, Vellur. Uh, Madam is also the treasurer of Vellur Obstetrics and Gynecology for 2022, uh, and she has around 12 paper publications in national and international journals. Um, thank you. First paper of Manny. She is also an author for the article, and she is a prim uh, primary author. Right? Yes, ma'am. Sorry. So. I invite Dr. Pushpalata, madam, uh, to sh uh, share a screen and uh, start the paper discussion. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my slide is visible. You have to make it slideshow, Pushpalata, otherwise it's visible. Yes, yes, it's visible. Yeah, it's correct. Uh, first, I'll uh, thank uh, Dr. Lakshmi, Dr. Charmila, and Dr. Madhuri, and Dr. Parag to giving this opportunity to have a part of this uh, discussion. And then also I want to thank Dr. Manisa, which is also the co-author of the study and a co-guide during my clinical journey. So I'm presenting that uh, a retrospective study analyzing the indication and outcome of mid-trimester emergency cer cervical circulars. This is done in the tertiary uh, perinatal center over the half decade. So introducing this uh, cervical insufficiency, this is uh, defined by the maternal and fetal medicine uh, as more than one early preterm birth and or second trimester loss with cervical length less than 25 millimeter or on transmission and ultrasound before 20 feet, uh, 24 week of gestation or, or the dilatation more than one centimeter on clinical examination. Uh, the prevalence uh, for the cervical insufficiency is less than 1%, but it accounts for more than 15% of the pregnancy loss uh, in 16 to 20 week of gestation age, and this is the one of the leading cause of preterm birth. So prolonged pregnancy definitely have a positive impact on the overall neonatal survival. Uh, in the developing world, uh, the, we have all the data from the developed world that show the estimated neonatal survival rate at 25 week of gestation is, is 54%, which progressively decreases to 38% at 24 week and 23% at 23 week. So uh, uh, placing the cervical circulars involve the placing of the bursting suture around the open cervix and thus preventing the fetus from the being expelled. So that is basically giving a mechanical support for the prolonging the pregnancy. The two type of emerg circulars, emergency and prophylactic, depending on the uh, how the patient is presenting. If a patient is presenting with pain or with the say, uh, open cervical os, it will be emergency. Prophylactically, basically, are a history indicated which the patient had the previous history of uh, preterm birth and or second trimester pregnancy loss. Then we can do the prophylactic class. This, so later on, this is also classified as a history indicated, ultrasound indicated, and physical examination indicated. Uh, most of the available evidence says, evidences suggest that the best result in terms of perinatal outcome are achieved by the prophylactic circulars. The complications such as intraoperative rupture of membrane, chorea, 
laceration and suture displacement are more commonly associated with the emergency cyclase. So this study we have started as a to analyze the indication, success rate, and complication following the second trimester, mid trimester uh, emergency cyclase. So this study design was retrospective study. It was done in the tertiary care perinatal center. The time period was from June 2014 to May 2019. The population included was uh, uh, all women with singleton or twin pregnancy who had undergone emergency cervical cyclase. Data we have collected from the uh, hospital elect electronic uh, database and the hospital medical record department. We got the ethical clearance and this uh, study was uh, approved by the Institutional Review Board and Ethical Committee. So starting the study, with the, all the, uh, we included the all women with singleton or twin pregnancy who underwent emergency circulars during the study period. We have excluded all the cases <coughs> who had preterm, premature rupture of membrane or if they had threatened or established preterm birth or if they had Coriamnitis prior to circular placement. Here we have uh, defined the emergency circulars as a placement of cervical circulars in women who has presented with clinical symptom of heaviness or pressure in the lower abdomen or pelvic area and or vaginal bleeding in absence of low lying placenta. Uh, we have also uh, defined the per speculum examination showed cervical dilatation with or without protruding membrane and short cervix on transvaginal ultrasound with cutoff value of 2.5 centimeter in singleton pregnancy and two centimeter in the twin pregnancy. For the surgical method, we have uh, most of the my patient had the McDonald uh, method for the cervical circulars. This was done under spinal anesthesia in the lithotomy position. Uh, suture was used as a non absorbable braided black silk suture number one. Uh, the ca in case of protruding membrane uh, uh, to prevent that uh, intraoperative rupture of membrane and the technique used to prevent the intraoperative rupture of membrane was first uh, uh, retrograde bladder filling. If that is not produced, then uh, reverse tendon bulk position and gentle pressure with a moist sponge on a stick. Uh, um, as a hospital policy, we have given single dose broad spectrum antibiotic to all the women. Uh, there, are, there are no uh, uh, post-operative prophylaxis or antibiotic were used to the micronized or injectable form were used for uh, almost all the women till 34 weeks of gestation age. So statistical analysis we have done, the data entry was done in the EP data software and the statistical analysis was done in the SPS uh, 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 science. Uh, we have used the categorical vari variable that is uh, parity or type of pregnancy or history of mid uh, trimester loss or previous history of circulars, and it is reported in the frequency or percentage. Continuous variable like age, BMI, cervical length, birth weight were used in the this uh, calculated with the mean and standard deviation and median and intercoarital range. E test was used for the comparison of time interval between the placement and the delivery in the singleton and, uh, and multiple pregnancy. And Fisher exact test was used to comparison for the categorical variable in the single and multiple pregnancy and p-value is considered as a statistically significant. So coming to the outcome, the primary outcome we have looked at is success rate, failure rate, and latent period after emergency circulars. We have also looked for the secondary outcome as a maternal and the neonatal. Maternal outcome, we have looked for the rate of the choreomatis, preterm premature rupture of membrane, preterm and preterm birth. And uh, for the neonatal uh, mor morbidity, we have looked for a lot of things, and but uh, we have taken any one of them or person as a positive, like low birth weight, hypoglycemia, hypocalcemia, hyperbilirubinemia, and uh, neonatal sepsis. We have, uh, later on, we have also done some subgroup analysis uh, to look for the effect of the comparative success rates between the different clinical presentation if they have presented with soft cervix alone versus with the soft cervix and bulging membrane. We also have looked for the comparative success rate and failure rate with different progesterone group like macronized progesterone versus injectable progesterone. So here we have defined the success rate as a percentage of pregnancy resulting in live birth after 28 weeks of gestation 
follows a circular placement and still birth rate is the defined as the birth of a baby beyond 28 week without any sign of life. The, here mid trimester loss we have defined loss of pregnancy before 28 week. 28 week we have taken as a in our center the period of viability we have taken as a 28 week. That's why that uh, the period we have taken like that. And failure rate is a percentage of pregnancy resulting in mid trimester loss or stillbirth beyond 28 week. The Latin period, which is the interval between the circular placement and the delivery, and early neonatal death is defined as the death of live or uh, live baby, uh, live born or baby for the first seven days of life. So, coming to the uh, flow chart, what we have done. So, uh, during the study period, uh, we have looked for the all the medical record data and uh, from the operation notes and the and the uh, theater list. And we have got that uh, total number of circulars done during a study period was 86. So we want to look only the patient who had only emergency circulars. So we excluded all the patient who had elective circulars. So we excluded 40 patients. So uh, finally, we got emergency circulars done during the study period was 46. In this one, 25 was singleton and 21 were twin pregnancy. So is in this uh, group, uh, we started to look for the maternal and neonatal outcome. During that uh, chart review, we have uh, not found the detail of three women. Uh, uh, so we have taken as a no detail available and it is excluded from this one. So finally, for the analysis, we have taken 43 women out of this 23 were singleton and 20 were twin pregnancy. So final analysis was done for the 43 women. Coming to the outcome, in this 43, mid trimester loss was in three women. Uh, still born was three and the live birth was 37. In this live birth, singleton was 21 and 16 were uh, uh, twin pregnancy. After the live birth, only three women had the um, early neonatal, three baby had the early neonatal death. So finally, at the end, we have uh, 53 women as a 53 neonatals for the live born. Coming to the baseline characteristic, we have looked for the baseline characteristic like age of the woman, what is the BMI, what is the parity, mean is gestational age at uh, circulars, what are the type of pregnancy, it is a single pregnancy or multiple, uh, any history of previous, any first trimester loss, any history of early neonatal death or uh, um, any history of uh, late neonatal death, any history of a stillborn, any previous history of mid-trimester loss, any previous any circular uh, cervical vehicle seizure trauma or any associated uterine congenital malformation, any history of previous circulars, or uh, uh, we have also looked at the length of the cervical length at the time of surgery and what the membrane were protruding or not. So coming to the outcome, uh, uh, there is a, we have uh, the primary outcome was the success rate and the failure rate. Success rate was the live birth. So in the single turn, we have 91% of the live birth, but in the twins, we have 80% of the live birth. Although the p-value is 0.22, it's not a statically significant, but actually it's a live birth rate and the, uh, in the twins and the single turn pregnancy was good. The failure rate, which is the combined, uh, rate of the mid-trimester loss and the stillborn was 8.6% uh, in the single term and around 6.5% uh, in the uh, multiple pregnancy, which is also statistically not significant. Uh, the Latin period, which is the interval between the placement of the cervical circulars and the delivery was around 64.8 days in the single term pregnancy and 51.3 in the twin pregnancy. This is also statistically not significant. And the mean gestational age is around 33.3 in the singleton and 31.4 is in the multiple, which is good enough gestational age for the neonatal viability and good outcome. Uh, uh, and neonatal sepsis was only 9.5% in the singleton and twins pregnancy has 25.0%, uh, uh, which is statically is not significant, but it's near to this statistically significant value. So twins have more neonatal sepsis and the neonatal morbidity compared to the singleton. Com uh, composite neonatal morbidity was significant, statistically significant in the twin gestation. Coming to the matter, the preterm premature rupture of membrane uh, was overall was 34.6%. 
preterm labor was 23.1 percent. Uh, preterm labor uh, resulting in preterm birth was 53.8 percent, and the women had chorionitis around 11.5 percent. Coming to the gestational age of delivery, we have looked for the gest different gestational age after circulars, the age of, gest uh, of delivery. Uh, uh, we had up to 28 week, almost 30%, 30.2% uh, 30 of women delivered. Around 28 to 32 uh, week, 4.6 women have delivered. Beyond 32 week is uh, uh, almost like 70% uh, of the women delivered beyond 30, 60% delivered beyond uh, uh, 32 week. Now doing the subgroup analysis between the short cervix and short cervix with the bulging membrane. Uh, this is also not significant. 90% women has short cervix and 81.8% and women has both short cervix and the bulging membrane. All the difference was not statistically significant. Coming to the um, outcome uh, with the woman who has used either vaginal progesterone or uh, injectable progesterone or combination of both. So in the looking for the success rate as a live birth, if the woman has used vaginal progesterone, 80.9% was the live birth rate. For the macronized progesterone, uh, it was 78.9%. If they have used both, then it was 80, 83.3%. This is also not statistically significant. Now, coming to the comparison with the other similar study, we have uh, some retrospective study and some uh, um, uh, meta-analysis also. Uh, in our study, uh, this uh, we have compared the singleton and twins, uh, that for the twins, uh, only, only Levin et al. has looked at, but most of the study has uh, looked for the singleton only. On, only we got fewer study, we have uh, compared the outcome for the singleton and Twin pregnancy. One of these is the Rebele et al. This was the meta analysis. Uh, and the protruding membrane is also not looked by the most of the study. Only Ju et al. has looked for the presence of protruding membrane and their outcome. Comparing the success rate, uh, our success rate was 86.4%, which is similar to the Prasad et al. This was also a retrospective study. And uh, uh, other uh, similar to that is Rebele at all, we have got 75% 75% in the twin pregnancy and 71% in the 75% uh, in the singleton pregnancy and 71.0% in the twin pregnancy, which is little lesser than the outcome. Uh, other than that, we have looked for the uh, success with the protruding membrane and then uh, median age from the diagnosis of delivery, mean birth weight, mean gestational age at delivery, which is uh, almost similar in most of the study, like 30, around 30 to 34 weeks. Uh, looking for the maternal complication, none of the study have looked for the maternal complication, like the intraoperative rupture of membrane or cervical laceration or chorionitis. Uh, we have looked for the, any history of uh, uh, intraoperative rupture of membrane or chorionitis. There is only one study have looked at the uh, uh, Isalipur at a, where that uh, cervical laceration rate was 7.9% and the intraoperative rupture was 4.1%. In our case, that actually that the intraoperative rupture of membrane was quite high. Uh, but we have looked at not only intraoperative rupture of membrane, but also uh, later than also, we have included those uh, women also who had the rupture of membrane later than the procedure. So concluding my study, uh, in careful selected case for the emergency circulars has a favorable outcome. The overall live birth rate was 86.4%. Success rate was similar to both in single pregnancy. Also, there was an improvement in the perinatal outcome by prolonging the gestational age by nine weeks. All the evidence is for beneficial effect for the prophylactic circulars in multiple gestation is lacking. Emergency circulars may have a role in twin gestation. The strength of the study, we are not only studied the pregnancy outcome following the placement of the circulars, but also look for the maternal complication following circulars, which has been reported in few, very few studies. We also compared the outcome with the singleton and multiple pregnancies. Limitation, we, although this was a retrospective analytic data, so we don't have the accuracy, uh, which is depending on the uh, recording done by the treating physician. 
and we did not compare the outcome with those of the women who have undergone expectant management. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Pushpalata. It was a wonderful uh, presentation. May I ask you to stop sharing the uh, screen, please? I would like to ask Dr. Asha, the international expert, for her opinion uh, regarding this paper. Thank you very Thank you much. Very much. Yeah, it was an excellent... Mm. I'm sorry, I was having um, some... Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yeah, we, we can hear. Yes, we can okay, hear. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I was getting a lot of facts because I didn't know if my comment. So, excellent study. Congratulations. I think it takes guts to report on a study like this on a condition which is not very common, common enough that we see it because we work with high risk patients, but not common enough for the general OBGYN to see it on a regular basis. So, I, I think it was a great effort and congratulations. Thank you. Um, a few things, you know, that I would, uh, you know, I don't know if you thought about what would you do differently if you had to repeat the study. Um, so, Dr. Kumari, do you do you have any input into what you would do slightly differently if you were to repeat the study? Uh, yes, uh, actually, we have not looked for the expectant management and. Uh, so some patient have under the expected management had the prolongation of pregnancy that we should have compared with the twin pregnancy and the singleton separately for that also. Perfect, yeah, exactly. So, you know, these are studies that are very difficult to do on a, in a prospective fashion. And so you end up doing retrospective studies. Mm -hmm. And as Dr. Beck so wonderfully, she explained to us limitations of retrospective study, uh, advantages of prospective study, advantages of randomization, which it's very, very hard to do. But, you know, there was one paper I wanted on uh, emergency circlage, and, and I don't even know, let me see if I can share it. Uh, but there was a randomized trial that looked at the very question, um, and I don't know if you can see it, it's right here. It um, and it was done purely for twin gestation, and uh, the fact that you had very few patients, you know, I think you had 30 odd patients, which is remarkable in a single center. This was an eight center study, which was a randomized control trial. And in this random control trial, they only looked at twins and they looked at cervical dilatation. They did not short, but purely dilated cervix, one to four centimeters and they randomized them. So, you know, randomized trial, again, would be beneficial if possible, but sometimes in one single institution, it's not possible. So you end up doing retrospective study and you end up doing uh, studies that are, um, you know, uh, mixed studies, meaning twins and uh, singletons. Um, I, I had some points down and I'm just not able to load my PowerPoint for some reason I have, points over here, but it just, it's just, and, and the IT person isn't here to help me. Uh, but anyway, so I think if I were to do it again, I would do it in a prospective fashion, if possible. Like that's, a, that's an impossible thing. It'll take you your entire career to do it. And then do twins separately and singleton separately, do dilated cervix separately and short cervix separately, because these are two different entities. And, um, you know, control for things. Um, I, I don't know, Dr. Kumari, if you came across the meta-analysis of emergency circlages. It was published two years ago. I'm going to see if I can pull it up here. Um, so it was done, uh, it was a meta-analysis, and, and as Dr. Beck's meta-analysis are supposed to be very good. So, you know, I was happy to see that. Um, and I'll share this screen with you. So this was a meta-analysis done um, that was, it's right here. Um, so it was published by people from Greece and they had over a thousand patients that singletons only 
emergency circlages. And they, they were in the study, they don't clearly, in spite of there being more than a thousand patients, even then they were not able to clearly show that it helps. In a subset, it did help, but overall it wasn't as impressive. So I think picking up this study and doing it was absolutely phenomenal. I mean, I truly congratulate you, but I would repeat it if possible prospectively and take your, I was trying to do my PowerPoint, it won't go. Um, and that's okay. It won't go. That's fine. That's fine. I'm okay. It's not coming now. No, it's okay. That's fine. Well, we so, could see. You know, I would do it prospectively. I would randomize it. But again, you know, congratulations because you won't be able to do that unless you do a multi center study. Uh, but, but congratulations on you. I think it takes guts to do such studies. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. I'm um, actually a presentation is seen. If you want to, please, you'd, you'd be happy to, you know, kind of. Yeah, we, we could see the slides. We could see the slides, actually. <laughs> just need to share the. You know, this won't move up. That's my problem. I have uh, I have these slides and they, it's refusing to move up. And it keeps saying loading because I have taken down some points. Um, and it, it just doesn't want to work. I don't know what to do. Um, it's just refusing to work. Let me turn it off. I'll turn it off and then I'll turn it back yeah. on. Maybe, yeah, yeah, yeah. maybe it'll do it then. Uh, so I had pulled up some points. Um, so um, it was on my Dr. Asha, by the time you try, we'll ask for the national experts' opinion so that we, you, you get bet, time to do it. You that, bet. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Yes, thank you absolutely. So thank Dr. You. Ash, yeah, thank you. Dr. Ashi, sir, your opinion on the paper. You have to unmute yourself. Yes. Thank you, Chamila. I think it is an excellent study. And as Asha said, um, it's quite, uh, some of the findings are quite remarkable, you know. Like, for instance, what I noted was in the population, um, the, they did uh, equal number of elective and emergency uh, uh, circlage. And uh, the population also shows that uh, there were, you know, they, they, they took twin pregnancies at, at the same time along with the single down pregnancy. So that is what actually surprised me, although she could have excluded the twins and taken up the single down only, but she was courageous enough to take up the twins together with the uh, single down. I won't have done, uh, done that. But I would like just to ask one question to Pushpalata. Suppose you are you are asked to do this study once again, would you like to review your the uh, average period of gestation of putting in the stitch? It was 23.3 weeks, right? 23.35 weeks for putting. Yes, now, would you like to, uh, when you do, when done prospectively, it was retrospective, not in your hands. Would you like to uh, uh, bring the period of, uh, period of gestation a bit down or you would continue around that time only, 23.3 weeks? Because by 23.3 weeks, uh, in, 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 in the cases who are destined to go for preterm labor, most of the changes have already taken place. So would you like to take up in a, a lower gestational age or the same gestational age would you like to continue? So actually, this study was uh, emergency circular. So the mm -hmm. age of gestation age which the women are presenting, that we have to take up. Yeah, so I understand. If we are yeah. prolonging the pregnancy till they reach the period of viability, which we are taking as a 20 week in our institute, that will be quite beneficial for the neonatal outcome. So even if you're gaining, uh, putting that uh, circular and gaining at uh, if you're putting at 22 or 23 week and gaining four week also, that would be quite beneficial for the new need. So it depends Correct. on where the patient are presenting and uh, we are we are able to take that for the emergency circulars. Right, uh, uh, but uh, one thing I, I saw in your results and analysis was that you have uh, taken up uh, stillbirth as a measure of failure. Do you yes. think that the stillbirth should be a measure of failure? Because this has many components. Silva has many components. So failure of uh, the stitch, how do you determine? I think uh, most, most of us will not agree that stillbirth is a measure of failure. And the other things are the, the single town has a success rate of 91% and twins have a success rate of 80%. 80 that is also a surprising fact for all of us. Anyhow, it's a very good study, very bold study, I must say. And uh, uh, yes, what is your opinion about stillbirth? Still, but if they have, uh, like if they have that uh, 
நோ லைஃப் டில் நோ சிம்டம் ஆஃப் லைஃப் அட் த அட் த டைம் ஆஃப் பர்த் ஸோ விச் இஸ் டெலிவர்ட் பியாண்ட் டுவெண்ட்டி எயிட் வீக் ஸோ தட் வி ஹவ் டேக்கன் எஸ் எ ஃபெயிலியர் ரேட் ஆர் இஃப் சி ஹேஸ் எக்ஸ்பெல்ட் பிஃபோர் டுவெண்ட்டி எயிட் வீக் தட் இஸ் த மிஸ் ட்ரைமெஸ்டர் லாஸ் ஸோ வி ஹவ் டு டேக் தட் இஸ் எ ஃபெயிலியர் ரேட் combined with the mid trimester loss and the still birth. No, Pushpalata what sir wants to know is the cervical suture was put for a, a particular indication that is uh, we wanted to avoid a preterm birth but still birth is a totally different entity there yeah. may be some other reason for the still birth also so may why I do you attribute to a question. failure of the still yeah, I answer that question yeah since I'm the corresponding author that's a very valid point that you have brought uh, sir I think what you are saying is uh, true that all still births might not be attributable to in fact preterm birth uh if at all there is an early neonatal death not exactly a still birth and still birth could be because of n number of reasons so probably we should have if we had excluded still births our failure rate would be even much lower i think yeah. because we said we said mid trimester loss rate because of going into preterm births and uh, still birth we had taken an early neonatal deaths also we had taken in that thing so that's a very valid point that you have uh, pointed thank okay. you so much ashish sir can i ask yeah. poonam madam to uh, give her opinions please Uh, yes a very good evening to all of you so uh, first of all dr pushpalata really congratulations for such a wonderful study even though we know that retrospective studies somewhere come in the little lower level but for such cases how can you do prospective study is a question because uh, uh, you know continuing it for this many years and all that stuff and then uh, coming into the expenses and all that what you have there now uh, there are few things which i would like to uh, mention here uh, one is that uh, you have written about neonatal death and stillbirth uh, uh, rates uh, the stillbirths also so again sir has already raised that question so i am keeping it to neonatal deaths so are we contributing neonatal deaths because of preterm birth which they have happened Uh, which have happened or yes. are we contributing that we put the circle large and uh, that was the reason that uh, he delivered earlier and all that so that clarification has to be there uh, very clearly which is probably missing that when we are talking about neonatal death and we are talking about the still but what are we exactly aiming at and why are we discussing that Uh, there are certain things which are more important pertaining to the state per se so i think that was my one point second is that we are saying that the outcomes were very good so are we really talking only about the stitch or we are talking about stitch and medical chirurgy which comes on to be progesterone and uh, uh, there has to be a comparison of not only oral as i mean micronized progesterone and uh, uh, injectable progesterone but there were some who were using both so how do we uh, you know extract the conclusion from that that was my another point which i wanted to discuss and then one more thing as this has been the retrospective study of the Uh, records uh, and uh, there are some uh, records which are uh, it would be probably the written records and some would be the electronic records so my question is that it's all right that that the time of circulage we did not give tocolytics but being in india i know that there's a system of giving tocolytics uh, post circulage when they are discharged and then after that you follow them with progesterone and tocolytics so that well, was there any kind of follow up which could tell us that uh, uh, you know probably they did not use uh, uh, tocolytics or tocolytics were very important uh, in these cases so i think these are uh, some important points and one last point which i would like to mention which could have been uh, uh, an additional information in your study whenever you put these emergency circulage many cases we have seen uh, when they come for delivery pre term uh you know they have a bucket handle tear or an annular detachment of cervix or something like that so i think if we would have mentioned those kind of complications probably it will give a better review to the uh to the peer group or uh, or the audience that uh, uh, these are the major complications which are actually life threatening 
So uh, these were my few points. Otherwise, uh, I agree that uh, there are certain cases or certain uh, uh, complications, uh, uh, such as uh, what you have taken, that emergency surplus, where you know you can't do randomized controlled trial because ethically you are not right. If you can save a baby, you can save a baby. Similarly, in PPH, you can't do randomized control trial. The major problem which is coming is that where you know you can save the baby, why don't you give that particular, uh, you know, treatment to the women? So ethical approval in such cases where you try and do randomized control trial in such cases, uh, it is very difficult. So these were my some points. Uh, and I also prepared a few slides. If Charmila, we have time. Uh, how do we review the article and uh, what are certain important salient points which we should look into as experts or uh, when we are reviewing any article or reading any article, uh, that would be really Ma good. Madam, can we have it at the end of the second paper yeah. once we finish the discussion? End of the second. Thank you so much, ma'am. Yeah. Dr. Pushpalata, you, you would like to answer ma'am's questions? Uh, yes, I want to answer. So first, the starting that uh, I actually start from the behind. First, the last question was there that uh, we uh, that she ma'am has already answered that we will like to do the look for that uh, randomization which is correctly is not ethically proof uh, uh, correct if we, we have some treatment option that can prevent the preterm birth and the mid trimester loss we should be able to do that test. The other question ma'am has asked uh, we have looked for that uh, macronized progesterone and that was the vaginal then injectable and the combination of both. So we have looked for the outcome as a live birth in all the three group and we have found no difference between the all the three group. So uh, that is not going to change that uh, uh, outcome even if you're using which type of progesterone for the prevention. The third thing is the uh, we want to look for the outcome for the tocolysis. Actually, this was a retrospective study. So the time which we have taken for this study that time only that uh, have started to use the tocolysis for the emergency cyclas. So uh, when we have started this study, uh, before that, we this paper has not come to use the tocolysis for the preterm birth, for the second trimester loss. So we that data we definitely will not have. Now, slowly, slowly people are using as a tocolysis. So if we do the later study, we can compare with the tocolysis and non tocolysis also. That will be one uh, further study we can do. Thank you so much. And I think uh, uh, many of the, uh, Dr. Asha has already presented the, those uh, two very important uh, articles. And there are several case reports. If you go into the uh, literature, there are several case reports which have come where emergency surplus has been there and uh, it has given a lot of success. Uh, so thank you That's for a lovely, lovely presentation. You know, I, I, my slide presentation, I could get it. Can I just quickly share those yeah, couple of yeah. points? Can I yes, just yes. ask one question? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma I just wanted to know, did you do high vaginal swab for these patients? No, uh, no this is not the part of our hospital protocol. So we are not using high vaginal swab for any of the patients. We're not doing routinely high vaginal swabs. Mm -hmm. If they have some feature of uh, choreomitis, those, those patients were excluded. Okay. But Asha, you can share your slides. Yeah, just very quickly, you know, if you were to do this study again, um, like I said, there was a meta-analysis recently of a thousand patients. I think Asha, you are logged in in two devices. Could you off one of the devices? Thank you. You know, the reason being, um, I, I, I'm in Coimbatore, we are at a fellowship program and, you know, I'm having issues here with the computer and I have nobody to help me. Can you still hear me and can you still yes, see yes, me? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, cool. Audible, okay audible. cool. So, you know, uh, so Dr. Kumari, if you were to do it again, I just want you to know that the recent meta-analysis just published within a couple of years is a thousand patients, singleton, so very, very pure study. Uh, but it's still the the results were still very questionable. So I wouldn't jump to conclusion that patients need to circulate based on, you know, I mean, you would really need to do a randomized trial, which is hard, very hard. Uh, the other thing, uh, so the second um, uh, question I had was, you know, including singletons and multiples, that sort of mixes up the results because we know twins are high risk. So it could really bias your results into showing that it doesn't work. 
Thirdly, some of the patients had bleeding and they were still included if it wasn't a previa, but bleeding is a setup for abruption and inflammation. So that might also spoil your results. Um, thirdly or fourthly, I guess, short cervix versus dilated. We know short cervix, not all of them will deliver preterm. Many of them will deliver at term. So that mixes it up. It's like apples and oranges. Um, and then of the 30, I think there were 30 odd patients in your study of which seven did not come for follow-up and it was by telephone and three just didn't show up. Um, so that can also affect your results. Um, and surprisingly, a third of them were primary gravid, which is really surprising. So maybe nutritional, maybe other reasons. Um, anyway, so anytime when you do a study, it's always best to, in your last paragraph, to discuss the strength and the weaknesses of the study. And that would make it really very powerful. So your study is very good, but adding to even the one with a thousand patients and even the randomized trial for dilated cervix in twins that was published just recently. And you know we were a part of that RCT. Eight centers, only 30 patients, but it was an RCT. Um, and so, uh, you know, the, the weakness was 30 patients isn't enough, but it took us two years to get 30 or two or so years to get 30 patients. So if you put your strength and weaknesses, people will read it instead of people just jumping in and starting to do circulages. You're, you're going to guide them and saying that, hey, listen, this is a great study, but we still need to do an RCT and you, you know, you need to stop and just look at that and don't jump to conclusions that we are saying that you must stitch everybody with either short or dilated cervix. That's not the answer. So I would clarify it because many people just jump in and start doing, oh, she did a circlat, so I'm going to do a circlat. So just educating the, the reader that don't jump to conclusions. This is a great study, but this is a step towards doing an RCT. So anyway, I really thank you for this wonderful study. I'm definitely going to share it with my residents. When I go back, I think it's great. And maybe we together could do a randomized trial. Um, thank you very much. I'm going to stop sharing. Ma'am, can I just uh, respond to your comments? Thank you so much for encouraging us. So a bit of correction there. So our sample size was 46. Our sample size was 46. So total 86 women underwent circlage, 40 had elective and 46 were the emergency. We did mention at the end, I think there were two slides uh, Dr. Pushpalata has put up on strengths and weaknesses. And in the weaknesses bit, we did mention that it was just one arm and that we could have had a larger sample size. We could have looked at the controls. We could have compared it with elective circlage. So all that has been mentioned in the limitation bit actually. And yeah, and all the points that you have uh, mentioned is actually well noted to Dr. Poonam ma'am's comments. Actually, tocolysis still that time when we were doing the circlage, we were not routinely giving, but now we have, uh, we have realized the importance of giving endomethacin, especially in women who are actively contracting. So that is something that we need to look into for the studies. And regarding the cervix being short, I think in the inclusion criteria, uh, uh, Dr. Pushpalata, it was not very clear. So I would just like to say, we just did not pick up women who had incidental finding of short cervix on ultrasound, but these were women who were actively contracting and presented with uh, heaviness and uh, you know pelvic pain, and then had a scan which showed a short, short cervix. So it's actually, not like an elective it's it's probably more of an emergency thing so but uh, again and that is why we were we did the subgroup analysis looking at short cervix alone and short cervix with bulging membranes so uh, that again uh, uh, showed us that there were no differences between the groups thank you thank you so much uh, manisha i'd like to thank dr asha dr ashish sir and dr poonam for their comments uh, thank you so much dr pushpalata for a wonderful presentation thank, thank you, you so well. much we'll go on to the next paper and uh, Anit, please introduce the experts and the speaker, please. Sure, man. Um, so our next uh, paper is the EVENTS trial. That is early vaginal progesterone versus placebo in twin pregnancies for prevention of spontaneous preterm birth. A randomized double control trial. It was uh, published in the American Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology in 2021. Uh, so I'd like to invite our experts for this uh, discussion, Dr. Mala Srivatsa, madam. She's the head of uh, gynecology, gynec oncology unit, senior consultant and professor of uh, GRIPMER, gynec endoscopic and robotic surgeon at Sri Ganga Ram Hospital, New Delhi. Madam is the vice president-elect ISOPAP 2324 and past president of AOGD21. I welcome you, madam. 
Our next expert for the discussion is Dr. Professor Tamkin Khan. Madam is the Professor JNMC AMU Aligra. Uh, Madam is a, a gold medalist. She has uh, 29 years of teaching experience. Uh, she has gathered around uh, 40 thesis papers and has around 120 paper publications. Um, I am honored to invite both our experts to our paper discussion today. Um, our presenter for today's paper uh, is Dr. Alina Mariam. Uh, she is the secondary PG register uh, MS Obstetrics and Gynecology at Christian Medical College, Bellur. Um, um, so I welcome uh, you to share uh, and uh, start the discussion. Thank you. Ma'am, I hope my slide is visible. Yeah, it's visible, Alina. Hello. Yeah, it's visible. Uh, good evening to one and all, respected ma'am, sir. Uh, I'm uh, Dr. Alina Mariam Shahjan. I'm doing my second year uh, in uh, see, uh, Christian Medical College, Vello. I'll be presenting on uh, events trial, uh, which is early vaginal progesterone versus placebo uh, in twin pregnancies for the prevention of spontaneous preterm birth, a randomized double blind trial. You can uh, click on that slide and then it will move, Alina. All right. Uh, preterm birth is a leading cause of neonatal childhood uh, neonatal and childhood death and disability, and the incidence of these adverse events are particularly marked in preterm, that is less than 34 weeks of gestation. Uh, so, vaginal administration of progesterone during mid-gestation period in women with singleton pregnancy and a sonographic short cervix was found to reduce the risk of preterm birth and improve neonatal outcomes. Uh, and it's also noted that in twin pregnancies, the rate of spontaneous early preterm birth is 10 times higher than singleton pregnancy. Uh, so, for, there's a strong evidence available that for singleton pregnancy, when administration of progesterone, that is 90 to 200 milligram, was given at uh, mid-gestation, it reduced the risk of preterm birth and it improved neonatal outcomes without any deleterious effects on uh, childhood development. So keeping this in background, uh, six trials were conducted in non-selected uh, twin pregnancies where 90 to 400 milligram vaginal administration of progesterone was done at uh, mid-gestation and they found no significant effect in the reduction of pre -term, early preterm birth. Reasons being, it could be either due to <clears throat> inadequate uh, dosage or the treatment had started too late in pregnancy. So uh, the hypothesis for this event's trial was in uh, women with twin pregnancies, when vaginal progesterone was administered at uh, 600 m uh, milligram at, from 11 to 14 weeks gestation up to 34 weeks gestation when compared to placebo, it should re significantly reduce the incidence of spontaneous preterm birth between 24 and 33 weeks of gestation. The objective of this study was that early vaginal progesterone for the prevention of spontaneous preterm birth. This was a randomized placebo-controlled double-blinded trial. The PICOTs of this study, P stands for population, which included women with twin pregnancies. I and uh, C are the intervention and control. So there were two blocks. Intervention was the uh, intervention block where the woman was, uh, was given the progesterone tablet and control was where the woman was given placebo tablet. And O stands for outcome, where both primary and secondary outcomes were studied. And uh, T is the time frame, uh, the period in which the study was conducted. And, this, uh, and S stands for the study design. The women who were included in this study were women older than 18 years of age, dichorionic, monochorionic, diamniotic pregnancy. If a scan has shown two live fetuses between at, uh, in a scan done at 11 to 13 weeks gestation and in a population who is fluent in this language. 
the women who were excluded in this study were excluded from this study was monoamniotic pregnancies mcda twin with early signs of twin to twin transfusion syndrome if any scan had shown a fetal abnormalities for example a nuchal trans uh, nuchal thickness of more than 3.5 mm uh, mm at the 11 to 13 and women with learning difficulties or serious mental illness if women were hypersensitive to progesterone or if they have any underlying uh, comorbidities where uh, intake of progesterone was contraindicated uh, women who has been on a progesterone medication for the last 7 days were also excluded from the study and if they have been a part of any other trial within the last 28 days they were also excluded from the study now coming to the intervention and control uh, so in both these intervention and control groups it was a self administration of a vaginal capsule twice daily throughout the study uh, that is from 11 to 13 weeks gestation up to 34 weeks gestation and the insertion should stop at 34 weeks or in an event of any early delivery now coming to outcome measures uh the primary outcome the main primary outcome was spontaneous birth between 24 weeks and 33 plus 6 weeks of gestation and multiple secondary outcomes were also studied like spontaneous birth between 24 weeks and less than 28 less than 30 32 and less than 37 weeks spontaneous or an indicated birth between 20 uh, 24 weeks and the same period of gestation like less than less than 30 weeks less than 32 weeks 34 and 37 weeks also so the uh, interval that is between the spontaneous birth or indicated birth between the randomization and the occurrence of the event was also studied and outcomes like stillbirth neonatal death and other neonatal complications were also studied the time frame for the study was between may 20 uh, 2017 and april 2019 this was a multicentric study because it was done in multiple maternity hospitals that is 22 maternity hospitals it was a double blind trial where the uh, researcher and the participants were blinded now coming to randomization and mass uh, masking amongst the eligible women who were uh, allowed to take part in the study it was randomized in a one is to one ratio simple permuted block so two blocks were uh, were assorted one was a progesterone block and one was the placebo block and uh, the uh, the population was randomly uh, as uh, randomly allotted into these two blocks and these placebo and progesterone tablets manufactured packaged labeled were identical uh, identical to each other in uh, in terms of appearance shape and size the participants investigators pharmacists and others who were involved in this study and the ones who were assessing the outcomes remained masked throughout the uh, throughout the study period uh the compliance and follow up of this study uh, was done in form of two methods one is a clinical follow up which was different for dichorionic and monochorionic twin in a dichorionic twin uh, after 20 weeks of gestation they were followed up every two weekly and in monochorionic twin after 16 weeks of gestation they were followed up two weekly follow up was also done on telephonic follow up basis after the last capsule of each blister pack was taken and even adverse effects if few patients had adverse effects to intake of progesterone even they were followed up on the basis of uh, telephonic uh, follow up adherence of this study it was checked by count, uh, counting the capsule returned by each participant on telephonic follow up uh, uh, each uh, on a, on the basis of telephonic follow up and in this study it was noted that 80% of the participants were adherent to 80% of the medication now coming to the sample size calculation uh, as per hypothesis vaginal progesterone would reduce the rate of spontaneous birth between 24 weeks and 33 plus 6 weeks to 13% in a placebo group and to 7.8% in a progesterone group keeping this in mind the sample size of uh, 1080 participants were calculated in order to get the power of the study to be 80% and to get a statistically significant p value of 0.05 and uh, as every rct will have a 10% attrition that is in uh, to account for the patients who have dropped out or lost to follow up they had uh, inflated the uh, recruitment figure to 1188
Now coming to the statistical analysis, statistical analysis was uh, done on uh, the following basis, that is uh, intention to treat, first logistic regression, uh, odds ratio was calculated, post hoc analysis was also done. Now coming to intention to treat analysis, in intention to treat analysis, what they did was they, uh, what is actually intention to treat analysis? In a prospective randomized uh, study, all the participants that are randomized at the beginning of the study, uh, that to whichever respective groups they were put at the beginning of the study were actually uh, accounted for till the end of the study, regardless of the treatment they had received. So what is, this is uh, the uh, intention to treat analysis is a corner any randomized control trial. Uh, so the, this, uh, the aim of this intention to treat analysis is it provides information about the potential effect of the treatment that is given in this particular group for general population. Logistic regression analysis was also done where confounding where primary outcomes were assessed, keeping aside confounding factors and a post hoc analysis was also done where uh, postdoc analysis is uh, at the end of the study, uh, what they did was they analyzed ad additional factors. For example, in this study, cervical length was also assessed to look into the primary and the secondary outcomes. Now coming to the results, the consort diagram to the study was uh, amongst the uh, 2,456 women who had been screened, 21.3% were excluded, making 1,933 women eligible for this particular study. 38% declined to participate, so making it 1,194 women were allowed uh, underwent randomization. So after the underwent after 1,194 women underwent randomization, 596 were assigned to receive progesterone medication and 598 were assigned to receive placebo. So out of the 596 women who were supposed to receive placebo from them, from them uh, 10 withdrew consent and four were lost to follow up. So 582 were analyzed at the end in the progesterone arm and 598 were who were assigned to receive uh, placebo drug, 11 withdrew consent. So uh, the, <clears throat> the uh, 582, uh, eight, uh, 584 were analyzed in the placebo wing. Now coming to the baseline characteristics, the baseline characteristics like dichorionic pregnancies, monochorionic pregnancies, cervical length, age, BMI, height, weight, and all were studied. And in both this progesterone and the placebo wing, the baseline characteristics were well balanced. Now coming to the results. The primary outcome studied was that spontaneous, uh, uh, spontaneous birth between 24 and 30, uh, 33 plus 6 weeks gestation. In the progesterone arm, 10.4% uh, had this primary outcome. And in the placebo group, 8.2% had this primary outcome. The p-value here was 0.17, which was not statistically significant. Therefore, the universal administration of progesterone at a dosage of uh, 300 milligram twice per day from 11 to 14 weeks gestation up gestation did not reduce the incidence of spontaneous birth between 24 and 33 weeks of gestation. So multiple secondary outcomes were also analyzed. The secondary outcomes analyzed were uh, the main secondary outcomes that were analyzed were spontaneous birth between 24 weeks and less than 28, less than 30, less than 32, and less than 37 weeks. And other secondary outcomes like uh, stillbirth and neonatal death were also analyzed. And it was noted that there was no statistical significance in the secondary outcomes between progesterone and the placebo group. A mixed effect logistic regression was also done when they looked into three other factors, that is monochorionic, uh, that is the chorionicity. Uh, they, looked into, uh, they looked into Paris women with previous preterm births and also the modes of conception. So the primary outcome, that is the rate of spontaneous birth between 24 and 33 plus six weeks gestation, it was noted that uh, high, it was higher in women with monochorionic gestation than in dichorionic gestation because it had 
a significant p value of less than uh, of uh, 0.006 it was also noted that this was higher in paris women with the previous preterm birth than in nulli paris women because this also had a significant p value of 0.01 there was no difference in the uh, pregnancies conceived by IVF or in ovulation induction or natural conception because the p-value was not significant because the p-value here was 0.43. A per protocol analysis was also done. Uh, and as we see in this graph, per protocol analysis is it was done in three groups, looking into adherence to the uh, medication that each uh, uh, that each uh, that the population was given. So less than 80 percent, more than 80 percent adherence, 60 to 70 percent adherent, and less than 60 percent adherent. Uh, so it was noted that uh, this primary effect, that is the rate of spontaneous preterm birth between 34 and 33 plus six weeks gestation uh, was uh, more in the case of um, uh, more than 80% adherent population. Uh, and uh, it was uh, less in that case, in the case of less than 60% adherent population. Now coming to uh, time to event analysis. Time to event analysis was also done in this study where the event was the cumulative incidence of spontaneous birth between 24 and 33 plus six weeks gestation, uh, which was plotted in the y-axis and the time is at different uh, gestational period. So here, this is a Kaplan cumulative percentage of participants who delivered spontaneously. So the, the blue is the uh, population who took the placebo uh, drug and the red is the one that took uh, the progesterone drug. So what it is, uh, this from this graph, we can see that uh, till 30, uh, till 30 uh, weeks of gestation, both the uh, placebo group and the progesterone group had a similar incidence of spontaneous birth that is from 4, 24 to 33 plus six weeks gestation but after 30 31 32 weeks gestation it was found that progesterone group were more had more incidence of spontaneous birth when compared to that of the placebo group Post-hoc analysis was done. Uh, Post-hoc analysis was also done for this study. Here, the post-hoc analysis done was with respect to cervical length, looking into the, uh, the primary outcome. This is also a Kaplan-Mayer uh, plot that is uh, showing uh, the uh, on the y-axis is the cumulative incidence of spontaneous preterm birth, and on the x-axis is the gestation. Uh, placebo is the blue uh, uh, the blue arm, and the uh, progesterone is the red. Done. So, in the population with uh, women with cervical length of three, less than three centimeters, it was noted that progesterone had lesser incidence of uh, preterm birth when compared to that of placebo. So, this showed that there was a potential benefit in this particular population with a cervical length of less than three centimeters. But and uh, looking into the population who had a cervical length of more than three centimeters, it was noted that uh, in this wing till 30 weeks of gestation, because both the uh, progesterone and the placebo arms were overlapping, there was, uh, 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 there was no significance in the incidence of spontaneous preterm birth. But after 30 weeks, it was noted that progesterone arm had a higher incidence of uh, preterm birth when compared to that of the placebo. Placebo wing. So this, uh, this the uh, the inference from this is it was like a potential harm to the patients who took uh, progesterone uh, tablet for a cervical length of more than three centimeters. Adverse events also were analyzed. Adverse maternal adverse events like uh, preeclampsia, eclampsia, pulmonary embolism, obstetrical cholestasis and fetal outcomes like uh, uh, trisomy uh, anom anomalies in the babies were all analyzed and there was no significant evidence of any difference between the groups in the incidence of maternal complication, adverse fetal or neonatal outcomes and maternal or fetal serious adverse events. Now coming to the conclusion, uh, in unselected twin pregnancy, 
administration of vaginal progesterone at a dose of 600 mg from 11 to 14 weeks gestation till 34 weeks gestation did not reduce the incidence of spontaneous birth between 24 and 33 plus 6 weeks gestation. Looking into post hoc analysis, vaginal progesterone reduced the risk of spontaneous preterm birth when administered in women with twin pregnancies with a cervical length of less than 30 millimeters and in women with cervix of more than 30 uh, uh, more than 30 millimeters it was uh, it it uh, it was like a may cause a potential harm of increasing the spontaneous preterm birth the strengths of this study sorry the strengths of this study was that there was a high acceptance to randomization. That is, there was more than 80% uh, acceptance to randomization. This was a double-blinded randomized trial. More than 80% of the population was adherent to the treatment. And there was low rate of withdrawal. That is, up, uh, that to as low as 1.8%. And a loss of follow-up rates were low. That is, up to 0.3% only loss to follow-up rate was present. Uh, now, uh, the limitations for, for the study was the sample size can not clear because the reference study or the pilot study for this study was not, uh, was not quoted. Uh, then the event, which is a spontaneous preterm birth, was uh, lower than that, of, uh, that anticipated. So study was underpowered for the primary outcome. And most of the conclusions were based on the post hoc analysis that is looking into the cervical length, uh, uh, which uh, may be considered exploratory at best. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alina. That was a wonderful presentation. My request to Dr. Mala ma'am to give her opinion, please. Alina, you can stop sharing. Yes. Excellent presentation, I must say. Dr. Alina, and definitely you have quoted a very good study, which is a randomized double blind trial. And uh, once we want to know that uh, we did not take consideration into other medical factors as well. You have just taken the twins into consideration and randomized them. Sometimes, you know, conditions like anemia, hypertension, preeclampsia, diabetes, all these factors can also contribute to spontaneous uh, labor spontaneous delivery. Definitely the factor that you have taken is length of the cervix. And you have projected that having this uh, cervical length less than three centimeter, that was the cut cutoff point. And the patients who had uh, cervical length more than three centimeter, in fact, they did worse with progesterone supplementation. That is something which is a very much highlighted pro uh, point in your study. And uh, you have to give this message to the public that unnecessary use of progesterone is not good. It may be, it may do more harm than good. If the cervical length is more than three centimeter, no need to add progesterone to these patients. And definitely when the cervical length is less than three centimeter, the progesterone may have an edge over the placebo studies. That is one thing which has come, which has uh, been highlighted and concluded in your study. And definitely we have to look into the medical parameters as I told the patients are having anemia. They are also going to give more chances of um, spontaneous delivery and hypertension, diabetes, which can be present in these patients of twin pregnancy. Though you said the patients who are having spontaneous twin or IVF or ART assisted twins, they all had the same outcome. But definitely when we Analyze our cases, patients who had ART or IVF, their profile is totally different from patients who had spontaneous twin gestation. So this point also has to needs to be looked into because we all know the patients who are undergoing IVF treatment, they are by and large, the age is not on their side, their other compounding factors are not on their side. So may these factors could have contributed maybe the incidence of spontaneous delivery in these patients. So on the whole, it's a good study and definitely you have presented it very well, highlighting most of the important findings and highlighting most of the important take-home messages as well. 
I must congratulate Dr. Anina for your wonderful presentation. Thank you, Mala Ma'am. I would like to welcome Dr. Parag, uh, the Vice Chair of ICOG, who has joined the program. Thank you, Parag, for joining. May I request Thamkin Ma'am to give her opinions, please. Congratulations, uh, Alina, on your presentation, the poise, your confidence, and the way you have analyzed the study. I would just like to ask you a few questions. Uh, you must have gone through, how does this add to the literature now, the current evidence, this trial? Uh, are you aware of any other trials that have been done on twins for prolonging uh, the pregnancy? We all know that preterm labor is one of the you know, most important complications of twins. So are you aware of any metalysis by Cochrane? What were the findings? Or even for singleton pregnancies, the role of progesterone in preterm labor. What was the outcome of those trials? The PRISM trial, the PROROM trial. Did you did you re, uh, uh, read these trials or? Uh, in the uh, end of this paper, there was uh, one. Uh, there were these uh, the six trials among twin gestations were uh, analyzed. Those six trials were showing there was no significant uh, evidence of uh, any change in the outcome in the, pri the primary outcome ma'am. The six trials I had gone through ma'am. Okay and Cochrane uh, has also done a meta-analysis for twins, the role of progesterone in twins. Are you aware of that? More than 4,500 women and this, this has not added anything much, isn't it? To the current evidence that is already there. Okay. So um, in fact the Cochrane analysis uh, also, you know, uh, says that uh, giving progesterone, right, like Dr. Maral said, we should not be using progesterone without evidence of its benefits. So uh, uh, giving progesterone to twins may even harm, and it increases the pre-prom rate at less than 34 weeks. So I think the, you chose a very important subject, a very important paper, and you presented the results very well. Uh, did they... Uh, notice any increase in uh, obstetric complications in those women who received progesterone, like GDM, like PIH, like gestational hypertension? No, ma'am, they haven't noted any significant uh, difference in the outcomes, in, like for comp uh, in the, keeping into consideration the complications, they haven't noticed any difference in both the wings. So are, are you aware of the literature? What it, does it say? Does adding progesterone increase the risk of these complications, the risk of DVT or the risk of, you know, polystasis. Yeah. Are you, are you aware of that? I should do. I'll, I'll read up. Yeah. That. Madam, so, it causes an increase in these complications. Yeah, it does. What are the complications, ma'am? GDM, the incidence of GDM, PIA, gestational hypertension, all these are increased. And in fact, a trial on triplets, it says that it increases the number of fetal losses if you give it unnecessarily in triplets. And uh, I, I hope you are aware of, you know, a very, uh, you know, recent publication in AJOG in January 20, uh, 2022. It's a retrospective study by Murphy et al., more than 18,000 women, population-based study, which says that uh, when you observe these uh, children, of women who have received progesterone during intrauterine life, especially in the first trimester, there's a very high risk of any cancer in these children. Uh, the, in the general population, it is 14. It increases to 30 per 100,000 uh, in those children who were followed up. So again, uh, we would all like to re-emphasize the um, importance of not using progesterone unless otherwise indicated. Dr. Asha, your thoughts on that? Unmute, uh, you need to unmute yourself, Dr. Asha. Um, um, yes. So, um, you know, I excellent presentation, totally impressive. I think you have great mentors who are mentoring you. Uh, absolutely superb. I, I really love listening to you. Um, in terms of... Um, uh, you know, I mean, how many patients did they have and they still didn't show any difference? If anything, they showed problems in those mothers. So that is really surprising. In terms of progesterone causing harm to a fetus, 
I don't personally know that data. So I was, while you mentioned it, I was very quickly trying to look for it and I'm still going to keep looking for it. But I wasn't aware that progesterone causes any harm to the fetus. Clearly in the mothers that don't need it, it created some issues, um, which is surprising because progesterone is being given by REI people to everyone. Uh, so I'm going to look up and see what harm it does. Um, can you please tell me, I, I think it was Dr. Sharmila that you mentioned or Dr. Shrikhande that it causes an issue with- Dr. Thamkin, uh, it, Dr. Thamkin was talking about it. She's mentioned it's 17 hydroxy progesterone, but actually it's, uh, or it's micronized it, progesterone to used in the study, ma'am. It was not 17 hydroxy progesterone. It is progesterone. micronized progesterone, yes. So does that micronized is, progesterone cause the same type of complications which 17 hydroxy progesterone has been portrayed so, in the- So we need to follow, follow yeah. yeah. Because this was done, you know, uh, on a population which has already been exposed. So probably it was not available at that time. So we can't say that micronize is safe. Because we give 17 hydroxy progesterone only after 16 weeks of gestation. We don't give it in the first trimester at all. Yes. So we need to look into it. Yes. Can I just answer to Dr. Uh, yes, yes, Manisha, please. Yeah. yeah so I so the study design actually they have designed it quite well, and the exclusion criteria. No, they clearly mentioned that ladies of got history of obstetric cholestasis, of history of genital cancer, breast cancer, liver disease. All they have nicely excluded. So actually, the number of women they have chosen as uh, the low risk women. And answering Dr. Mala's uh, discussion also about medical comorbidities, so they actually ex in their in their primary outcome they excluded all the women with medical comorbidities who required iatrogenic delivery. So if an IV pregnancy also required iatrogenic preterm delivery, that was not included in the thing. Only the women who underwent spontaneous preterm births were included. But as ma'am said, some women with anemia, heart disease can also have spontaneous preterm birth. So whether it actually represented uh, the thing, we have to look into it. Actually, <laughs> the etiology of uh, preterm labor is so you know, multifactorial. Multi it is very difficult to choose the right patient. Yeah. Yes, yes. With very only one, one high risk factor. It is very difficult. Yes. We'll have very few cases then. Yeah. Yes. But that was scary using progesterone for a person who's got a long cervix and going for a preterm birth. Yes. Yeah. I also yeah. want to know even vaginal progesterone can have effect, Dr. Tamkin. I I'm I'm not aware that they, these children will have malignancies. So even vaginal progesterone. There's a new study that published just in you know in January, and mm -hmm. it's a huge population, eighteen thousand. And is it oral or vaginal. The, the children who received the intra the fetuses who received this during their intra uterine life from 1950s they have you know okay um, they have analyzed yeah so, I think the progesterones were different huh. 1950s yeah. the progesterones were different Ali yeah. or of any any drug in fact the basic rule that do yeah. not use unless you are very it is really required yes, and it is different. unless indicated we should not use it. Yeah. If I can just add, so I just looked up, NIH has a site uh, that I have access to through University of Iowa. So I just looked up progesterone and this site is updated almost on a daily basis. So I, I will just, you know, I will just share it with you. So it, it does not show that progesterone has any harm on the mother. So this, this is called Terrace, I'm sure. Manisha, I'm quite sure you, you, you look at this all the time. It's the Micromedics Terrace and the Reprotox um, uh, through NIH. So this is for progesterone, all kinds of progesterone, but for pure progesterone, uh, not, not those old time progesterone. And it says here, the quality of studies is good. It doesn't cause anomalies. It doesn't cause virilization in therapeutic doses during pregnancy. It's unlikely to have any uh, problem, but the data are insufficient, obviously. The NIH always says the data are insufficient. Uh, they hate to ever say that they are sure, but anyway, so I just, just wanted to share it with you that as of today, they do not say that it causes any issues. So if needed, obviously we'll give it, but it's so surprising that it caused harm. It's like, if, do you know, could you, could, you, um, could you tell why, or can you make any guesses why this causes harm to somebody with cervix greater than three centimeters? Is it the sheer physical aspect of sticking something towards the cervix or why are they having problems? It's a naturally occurring hormone. 
any any thoughts uh, i think uh... i'm asking alina the presenter Um, uh, I didn't actually think about this question, but uh, uh, see, we don't do routine screening for cervical length, right? Sure. And uh, suppose uh, uh, we give progestones even without doing that, like, and it happens. It's it, it's quite scary to think about that you cost a complication because of a drug. That's a thought in everybody's mind. Uh, maybe inserting something into the vagina, make, maybe introducing infection. Yeah. And I'm just thinking of it. I, we do not know exactly. Now in India, we use oral progesterone right, left, and center. Yeah. Every company is coming with a diprogesterone. So the harm which it causes is something to think about. As Dr. Thumpkin yeah. said, do not use a drug which is going to go, which, which is not needed at that point of time. Maybe it causes the opposite also. So you have to think about it before we prescribe a drug. Madam Dr. Sheila Mane writes, maybe it's ca causing bacterial vaginosis, vaginosis. and infection. All that is all, uh, we have to, uh, it, it is not proved, madam. We cannot uh, uh, hypothecate on things like... You're just thinking okay. aloud. That's mm -hmm. it. Lakshmi ma'am, would you like to say something before we conclude? No, no, Charmila, you have conducted it very well. But uh, as you were saying about the cervical length, but nowadays I think every radiologist, gynecologist do mention about cervical length in the their ultrasound report. So I think yes. we all are getting the cervical length by default in our <laughs> reports. Yeah, I mean, I am yeah. getting. Yes. <laughs> and they add on more information than and needed. Uh, yes, as I am into IVF, so IVF pregnancies, we are left and right using uh, and all IVF centers are using. <laughs> so as Dr. Tumkin was saying, yes, we all have to introspect and go according to the evidence-based uh, prescriptions. But I think that will take a long time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, the patients, they are very scared so, to even withdraw. Progesterone. Yes. All the guidelines, you know, they will say, do not give progesterone unless if you go to, you know, RCOG, ACOG, uh, fetal medicine. Except for IVF. They say that they have their own <laughs> protocols. <laughs> but Dr. Thumpkin, whatever is written, I mean, it is sometimes so difficult to practice evidence-based medicine. Even if we say ki one paper that you should not give, but every practicing clinician, especially we in private sector, do give progesterone to our IVF pregnancies. And that's why these papers scared us now. Yeah. <laughs> We're thinking twice. Now, <laughs> if, if you go into the guidelines, the only indication for progesterone we are guilty of prescribing it all the time, is mm -hmm. one with the previous history of abortion and yes, bleeding in the current pregnancy. Not even bleeding in the current pregnancy. No, mm -hmm. no need for progesterone. Yes. And of course, the uh, cervical length and previous preterm labor. These are the only indications which have been you know, proven to be, which are evidence-based. So yeah. it's so difficult, but you yes, know. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Parag, would you like to add something yeah. before we conclude? It's difficult to wean uh, ourselves off progesterone. Yeah. <laughs> right. I, th I think uh, most, of us are, are, uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, most of us are using progesterone uh, uh, on probably anecdotal basis. So whatever experience that we've had in the past or uh, you, know, you want to do whatever is possible to, to make sure that the pregnancy continues to viability. And in a desperate attempt, probably we... Uh, make it a point to uh, continue progesterone. In fact, you know, I've seen prescriptions where three or four different progesterones were prescribed to women who conceive with IVF. So that's uh, going a little overboard, but possibly... Uh, Parag, in that, no, no, in that re retrospective study, first study, they even CMC Vellur is used. <laughs> it's a combination of a vaginal and IM progesterone. So uh, somewhere somebody is justifying using those combinations. True, true. Actually, in, in the study, very few had a combination, mostly had some form of progesterone. progesterone. But this events trial analyzed the data. I was really quite impressed because they have analyzed it from different angles. No, They have not even just looked at the primary outcomes in terms of simple analysis. They have looked at kaplan mayer curve. They have looked at the forest plot. They have made box plot. And every data collates and comes boils down to the same information. 
you know whether you analyze it this way you analyze it that way so i i think that increases the validity of the trial that it's just not one you know uh, just one one off uh, observation that you are making but you analyze it for example there was a slide where i know I, i think she could not explain it very well there was a forest plot there where they had adherence on one side and they had the effects <laughs> so in women who were 80% adherent in both the groups whether progesterone or placebo group actually there were more preterm births on the uh, pro progesterone arm and in the women who were less than 60% adherent there were more preterm births in the placebo arm so th that is how so they have actually brought out very beautiful points there and then this post hoc analysis was done post hoc analysis was done later on before they had not specified it when they were starting the experiment but after the experiment they decided okay let's look at the cervical length and see whether the cervical length makes a difference and that is when they found out that less than 3 cm maybe it has a role more than 3 cm definitely no role so i way of triaging although as clinicians we are definitely nervous when we are dealing with high risk pregnancies or oh, what if she runs into mid trimester loss what if you know all those things are very much uh, valid fears but i think triaging based on the cervical length seems to be a good uh, uh, good uh, uh, triage method amkin ma'am you do like something before we conclude yeah i just wanted to uh, uh, inform dr asha that uh, this uh, up to date is highlighting this study on the first page use of progesterone in pregnancy you know the up to date uh, so i have actually written a chapter for that and sorry there's some problem yeah, with the some problem with her net this wait for a second and then we'll continue uh, i chamila meantime you can speak and Sam start yeah. she... i think she's joining <laughs> Asha? Uh, Asha, now you are with us here. So all networks are down today. I don't know the reason. For us in Western Uttar Pradesh, all networks. Here it is raining, ma'am. Monsoon has started. So Saudi. ours is also down. Asha, are you with us? So we'll get a we'll get a message for her from her madam and put it in the group. From yeah. she's left out. Shamila, you yeah, can. Yeah, yeah. Thank, thank you so much uh, to all the people who have joined this program. A special thanks to Dr. Lakshmi Sri Kande, the chairperson of ICOG, for giving us this opportunity to listen to such great experts. Thank you so much for the opportunity, ma'am. Like to thank Dr. Parag uh, for joining us in the program. The vice chairperson of ICOG was always uh, always is uh, yes uh, helped us in so many ways. Thank you so much, Dr. Parag. like to thank dr asha especially for joining uh, from in between a uh, busy schedule thank you dr asha for joining with us and for those valuable inputs i'll give you a minute after i conclude thank you so much uh, dr asha i know you have problems with your network thank you dr manisha beck the coordinator the head of unit from and professor from cmc vellore manisha i know i've troubled you a lot but thank you so much for giving us this time and have giving us such great presenters who did so well dr pushpalata and dr alina I'd like to thank all the national experts dr ashish mukhopadhyay sir dr poonam shivkumar dr mala shrivatsu and dr thamkin kan for joining us thank you for all your valuable inputs I'd like to thank all the delegates who have joined this program and a, a special thanks to neelima who was coordinated with us for all the program as well as uh dr J mr jignesh for his coordination thank you so much and a uh, special thanks to anit the moc for the program and uh, dr asha uh, please give your thoughts before we conclude just just a quick thing so up to date is very good when you're looking for something very quickly like at 2 in the morning somebody calls you a woman is here on you know on heroin and cannot breathe and it's like what do i do so up to date actually gives you a very good summary but in terms of them updating themselves they take 3 to 5 years to update any anything and at one time i'd actually written a chapter on vaginal bleeding in early pregnancy and it took uh, they didn't change it for 5 to 7 years so up to date is good for emergency purposes but if you want to really see uh, terrace and reprotox are your two two things to go to they are the absolute bed best because they get oh, yeah, updated yeah. daily and i i want to thank uh, dr back manisha that was excellent that you mentioned ad hoc analysis i think that's brilliant because the study didn't show anything mm -hmm. uh, you know randomized trial of 1000 patients didn't show anything and at that time those guys said 
wait a minute, we have studied 1,000 patients, we might as well have some answers. So ad hoc analysis was done after the study was finished to see, do we did we find anything? And that's when they found the cervical thing. So I, I think your talk on statistics was brilliant. I would love to have a copy of your slides. And I, I cannot thank you enough. And I think your, your fellows and your junior faculty should be thanking you. They did a superb job. So. You know, and thank you to everyone in Foxy. I, I feel very privileged that I'm able to participate. Thank, thank you, Dr. Asha. Thank you so, you so much, you. Asha. On behalf of ICOG, we are thankful to you. I know the time difference. I mean, there must be night and you are logged in physically and you are giving your input. So we are really thankful to you from bottom of our heart. And do come to our ICOG programs. We need your uh, inputs for another so many programs to come. And I'm actually you. in Coimbatore and we are doing an ultrasound workshop. And okay. so many Thank people you. are listening to you. Okay. So I'm here for, you know, they, they started a fellowship. So I'm here to help them with the fellowship. Okay. So I'm, I'm here for about two months. And okay. I'll be seeing you at I, AICOG. Oh, so great, great. So Chamila, we can involve her in many yes, more programs. She's yes, ma'am. Yes, ma I was Call really her. worried about the time difference, Asha. We kept Thank on asking, so should we postpone? But so she accepted. I'm here and I'm full of full of zest with all of you wonderful people it gives me a lot of strength thank you thank you dear thank uh, you thanks, Dr. thank you lakshmi ma'am thank you so thank much you for all. the opportunity Bye. Bye. see you Bye. okay so so much much really great Bye. program dr yeah. charmila thank you ma'am thank you thank you dr charmila for actually coordinating this wonderful program you are the one behind